economics may have changed since the beginning of the pandemic, or at least what policymakers and public opinion at large expect from the profession. No one is wasting time on asking us to justify why our forecasts differ from one another by a few decimal points, now that we got used to two-digit durations in GDP in the course of a few months. People have learned to focus on the distribution of scenarios, not on an ever more uncertain baseline. But the life of economists has also become more demanding because we're dealing with an entirely new shock. Comparison with wartime is appealing, of course, but wars destroy existing capital. In this crisis, capital is essentially mothballed. Yet, just like the Great Depression and then the challenge of rebuilding our economies after the Second World War, some of the received wisdom we've been operating with for decades now is being questioned, especially when it comes to fiscal policy. It seems the debate is now dominated by quarrels between Keynesians of various hues, exemplified, for instance, by the dispute between Larry Summers and Paul Krugman on Biden's fiscal push. All the other intellectual traditions seem to be sidelined for the moment. Beyond policy, economists are also busy trying to understand the long-term effects of the pandemic on the very fabric of our economies. I'm Gilles Moeck, and you're listening to Macrocast. As we relaunched Macrocast after a hiatus of a few months, I was looking for someone who would help us to think through the noise and guide us in this post-COVID world. I have to say that I immediately thought about Jean Pisani Ferry. Is one of those rare economists who constantly circulate between academia and active policymaking, never failing to reach out to the broader public, finding ways to explain with clarity the economic challenges that we're facing. It was the founder and director of Bruegel, a European economic think tank, which is located in Brussels. He teaches at Sciences Po Paris and the Harty School in Berlin. It was the main inspiration between Emmanuel Macron's economic plan during the campaign in 2017. And adding to his international reach is being a non-resident senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics in Washington, D.C. for some time now. You may have read his publications in Le Monde, Handelsblatt, uh, the FDA List, Project Syndicate, and the Chinese magazine Century Weekly. I could go on for a long time, so rich are his achievements and distinctions, uh, but I want this to be a conversation. So I'm going to ask Jean Pisani Ferry himself uh, if I have left out any important uh, feature uh, in his in his career. <laughs> kind of you, uh, kind of you, Jean. Uh, no, not at all. I mean, I, the, the only thing that I don't teach at the Hertie School anymore, I'm ah, affiliated with the European University in, Institute in Florence. Point taken. Uh, well, I'm very happy to have you with me, and thank you for inaugurating this new formula of, of Macro Macrocast. Um, Actually, before diving into the conversation, and uh, as a disclaimer, uh, I've known you for some time, actually, uh, I've never had the possibility to ask you one question, um, which may actually help our listeners to uh, uh, get to know you better. Why is it that, uh, I don't know if it's ending up or if you fell into economics, uh, it seems to be a form of vacation for you. And uh, what, what was the driver in, in this career choice? I sort of thought I wanted to understand the, the world around me. And that was, uh, you know, I was trained initially as an engineer. And uh, I, I found that uh, there was a, a world I didn't understand that uh, seemed to be very important. And so I, I went into economics and, and then never left it. <laughs> okay, so an engineer by, by trade moving into moving into economics. Uh, um there, there are many in my country, actually. Yes, it's a, it's a very French tradition. Um, now, it seems that uh, our economies are gradually, cautiously reopening for the second time, actually, uh, or sometimes the third time since the beginning of the, of the pandemic. But this time, thanks to the vaccines, it seems that it might be the right one. And uh, to start this conversation, Jean, uh, I would like to get your sense of how deeply damaging actually this crisis has, has been. Uh, I noticed that in a in an op-ed in Le Monde, you you sounded actually uh, a bit more cheerful, I would say, than uh, the the average of of, of economists I, I read. We need to to keep a um, sort of note of caution that we don't know. Uh, you know, in, on the health front, on the public health front, how things will will develop. I mean, the Recent news have been generally very good, uh, 
but the, the, the risk with the, the variant and, and the risk especially arising from the fact that uh, the, the developing world is, 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 you know, is still an incubator for, for variants, uh, I mean, dramatically so, um, the, the, these risks remain. Uh, so assuming um, that the public health situation continues to improve, I think at, the, at economists we have to, to think about the, the difference between this crisis and the crisis we we know. Um, the, we we are all very much under the influence of what happened after the, the global financial crisis, which was uh, um, long, not only long, but but left um, significant scars, uh, especially in Europe, less in the US, uh, but in many countries in the world, and and very very strongly so in Europe. And the point I think we we have to 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 realize, I mean, and, and and the discussion we need to have is why should it be the same, and and how can it be different? The first reason why it it could be different um, is that the policy reaction has been very different. Uh, policy reaction precisely because policymakers learned from the uh, global financial crisis and the mistakes made then um, has been m- much more forceful. Uh, much more sort of coordinated, if I can say so, between monetary and fiscal policy. And with a clear recognition that premature consolidation, premature withdrawal of the support would be dangerous because that's exactly what happened in 2011 in, in Europe when there, there was a the, the drive to consolidation came too early when the, when the economy was still very weak and resulted in a double deep recession. So the first reason is, is, is that, and we're seeing that the degree of support in 2021 uh, is about the same as, uh, as last year, and that there is no talk yet of consolidation for, for next year. The, uh, in the EU, the um, uh, escape clause of the Stability Pact is still uh, um, being activated. I mean, the, the talks are for removal at a later stage. But I think there is much more caution on the part of policymakers, even though some, but he's not a policymaker anymore, like Wolfgang Schäuble, the, the, the chair of the uh, German parliament and the former minister of finance, recently wrote that there needs to be a return to sort of normal, uh, normal times and uh, normalization, both on the fiscal and the monetary side. Can we discuss this for, for a while? Because there seems to be... Uh, quite a, a clear distinction between uh, the approach in the US and what we have in, in Europe, at least at first glance, that seems to be to be the case. Biden has embraced a sort of, you know, I would call this a, a macro carpet bombing approach to uh, uh, economic policy with a huge emergency stimulus, which is supposed to be followed by another four trillions of, of medium term uh, 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 package. While in Europe so far, uh, it's been a tad more hesitant. I mean, we have the next generation EU pact, which obviously is is very important, but which is a bit slow actually to to be dispersed. What, what do you make of this difference in approach across across the Atlantic? I wouldn't compare the European uh, Recovery and Resilience Plan, the next generation EU, to the Biden plan. I mean, the the, the Biden Mark One, which is the, the the recovery plan, is really a substitute to the uh, failings of the uh, the US uh, social state um, it's basically trying to find ways to you know offset the, the, the fall of income in income suffered by by many Americans uh, through ad hoc um, transfers and uh, and tax cuts uh, in Europe, we've had the, the furlough schemes uh, um, generally adopted, uh, basically following the model of what Germany did in, in, um, during the global financial crisis. And it has been much more effective, much, much better targeted, and you know, has generated much less anxiety and therefore much less precautionary saving than in the US. So, so I, f- Biden's reaction first is that. Second, Biden's reaction is very political because Trump had promised uh, the, the two thousand dollars per, per household, uh, you know, in additional money, and so Biden felt it, he had to, to 
to do the same. So there was a sort of an overkill um, in the in this recovery plan that was immediately a uh, matter for controversy, as you said in your intro. Um, uh, Larry Summers, Olivier Blanchard said, this is too much. I mean, we are in favor of supporting, uh, obviously, the economy at this stage, but but this is too much in view of the output gap that remains in the U.S. I mean, there's a slack that remains in the in the U.S. economy, and that's going to generate uh, tension on the labor market, uh, inflationary risk. It's going to force the Federal Reserve to re- react, and actually, we're seeing that developing in the U.S. In Europe, not so much. I mean, we, we, what we've seen is is a, is a response that has been very flexible. Very, very flexible, adapting to the degree of uh, constraint there was on the economy. After the initial uh, confinement, aggressive confinement, which precipitated a deep recession in in, uh, southern Europe and in France, there has been much learning in terms of how to target and tailor uh, what is being done uh, to minimize the economic damage. And there has been a lot of, uh, you know, uh, support through these flexible furlough schemes and uh, support schemes to to companies, uh, which I think has so far provided exactly what was needed uh, in order to minimize the damage. Now, for the next phase, the question is, um, will households uh, draw on their excess savings uh, or will they be scared by the situation in the labor market and therefore, will they be more, more cautious? And I think what we need is, a very, again, a very flexible strategy. Uh, the, the, the goal should be extremely clear. The goal should be, for, for the reason we're going to discuss, to uh, offset completely the, uh, the scars, uh, the, the, the damage left by this crisis. So there's no reason, in my view, to think that uh, the potential, uh, the economic potential, uh, should be uh, permanently reduced. And therefore, uh, we should not only aim at going back to the, the level of GDP before the crisis, we are still you know, below some 5% or so. Uh, so this should be obviously uh, offset. But, but moreover, I mean, the, the, the two years of without growth they should also be, be, be offset. So, so we should aim at going back to the, the trend that was the, the economic trend in before, before the crisis. And, and that, calls, that may call for supporting policies. So uh, I think uh, the, the, the essential is to have a goal not to accept this permanent loss uh, and to, to tailor policies depending on what's happening with household consumption, with uh, corporate investment, uh, on which we can be optimistic. But uh, so sort of to have a contingent strategy um, uh, in the case, you know, there is uh, hesitancy uh, and uh, fears about, uh, about unemployment uh, limit uh, household uh, spending. To, to play the, the devil's advocate on, on, on this and informed by uh, the speech by Wolfgang Schäuble, um, basically you're advocating uh, the continuation of uh, uh, strongly supportive policy. Uh, what do you make of uh, you know, the concerns around debt sustainability in a number of, of European countries? Um, the rules have been lifted provisionally uh, by, by the European Commission. There is no institutional issue to, to sort out, at least within the next the next two years. But there is still a question, a sort of macro question, about the sustainability of, of, of this. Because if down the road what we want to do is to normalize our economies, well, then at some point interest rates will normalize as well. So how do we square the equation of having uh, accumulated this level of, of public debt and private debt, by the way, as well, um, and having to face at some point, not now, but at some point, uh, normalization in interest rates. Do you, do you fear that we will end up at some point with the choice we had a few years ago, nearly 10 years ago now in, in a lot of countries between you know, austerity and, and, and crisis? Let me, let me first explain why I'm, I'm optimistic about uh, the, the potential. Mm-hmm. One reason is that investment, um, corporate investment, has remained relatively strong uh, during this crisis. If you compare 
corporate investment during the global financial crisis and during this crisis, um, obviously it has declined, but much less than during the global financial crisis, although the drop in GDP, it's much sharper. <laughs> Uh, so, so there is much more resilience of, of investment, and the the outlook for 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 this year is, is strong, um, including you know in technologies, uh, including in uh, in digital investment. So, in part, this may be you know investment triggered by by working from home and the need to provide employees with um, equipment, etc. But that cannot be the, the, the main reason. Uh, so there is, there is clearly evidence of, uh, you know, it, it, dynamism. And the reason is that the credit machine was not broken. I mean, the credit machine during the global financial crisis was broken. So companies could not get access to, to credit. They could not finance their investment. Now they can finance the investment. So this is, this is a big difference. And the second difference, uh, I would emphasize, uh, the third taking into account the, the attitude of policymakers, um, is that uh, this crisis is, you know, didn't come from something going wrong in the economy. It came completely from the, from the outside. And it has been an opportunity for, um, for companies, for employees to, to learn and to experiment new uh, ways of organizing work, new ways of organizing production, new ways of organizing sales. Um, so we, we're seeing uh, evolution that we are relatively slow, accelerating dramatically, like telemedicine. Uh, we're seeing electronic payment uh, accelerating uh, dramatically. So uh, this is a boost for uh, potential output, for e efficiency. Um, and after this crisis, this health crisis is over, company will have the ability to choose from a much wider array of organizations and technologies than before. And this, by definition, is again in, of inefficiency. So I think um, we should be, you know, really optimistic about the potential, even though some sectors obviously are going to suffer and some se sectors are going to suffer relatively lastingly. We're getting better news from the aerospace industry, uh, but long-term tourism, events, etc., they're going to suffer. Business travel is going to be down probably for uh, relatively long. So some sectors are going to, to, to suffer, but they are offsetting factors. So that's the reason why I, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, situation can improve significantly. Now, on your, on your point, um, Quickly, uh, the debt uh, issue uh, clearly is going to dominate the, the, the years to come because uh, you know the increase in public debt ratios is is really significant, uh, and it cannot be eliminated uh, too quickly because that would uh, that would have a, a drag imply a drag on on economic activity that would be too too damaging. So we have to to live with high levels of debt and reduce them gradually. Um, fortunately, the interest rate uh, situation makes it uh, feasible to to have this strategy uh, because, like what you know, many people tend to think, uh, the, the reason why interest rates are, are so low are negative is. In part, the action done by the central banks, but uh, in a larger part, and probably in a much larger part, uh, comes from structural factors. And those structural factors, they are most probably, we, we don't know very well, actually, uh, why interest rates are, are, are so low. But, but, you know, the trend started long before this crisis, long before the adoption of unconventional uh, monetary policies, it's fairly general. Uh, expectation in the market are that these uh, low interest rates are going to, to remain at, uh, at very low level for, for a long time. So concerns uh, about sustainability are sort of muted. 
I wouldn't go as far as saying that they have disappeared. No, we don't know. I mean, there are, there are risks. Uh, there are risks, especially for countries with a very high debt ratio. Uh, concerns can reemerge. Uh, nervousness can come back. Uh, but we have to start from this you know, analysis that there is something structural there. Um, also, speaking of high debt countries, uh, I think a very positive development in that in, in this crisis, it was widely recognized that you know a country like Italy uh, cannot just get out of its uh, uh, fiscal situation through consolidation without uh, having growth. Uh, Italy has had virtually no growth of GDP per capita for 20 years. Not virtually, actually, actually not, no no growth in GDP per capita for 20 years. And if uh, France had had the, the fiscal policy of Italy in terms of the, the, the primary surpluses of Italy, it would have entered this uh, decade with a much lower uh, debt ratio, you know, close to 50% instead of being close to 100%. So the problem of Italy is not fiscal policy. The problem of Italy is growth. Um, and the uh, here, the, 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 the plan, the European plan can, can help because this... It's it's second order for 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 Germany. It's second order for France. But it's it's a big investment in Italy, and it's an even bigger investment in some southern European country like like Greece and or or the new member states. Uh, so it can help in this regard, and I think uh, a lot depends on the on the effectiveness of this uh, of this investment boost and and modernization boost that is uh, being attempted. If I, again, to play the devil's advocate, uh, um, you sound very positive and you know, optimistic. It's probably the most optimistic uh, macrocast I've ever recorded, uh, the, which is good. We definitely need that. Um, one issue, though, on your point on you know, maybe the crisis has accelerated some positive features of our economies that will end up actually with some productivity gains here and there. Um, but what do you make of this idea that um, the way we've dealt with the crisis, in particular by making it you know, next to impossible for companies to default, uh, has created a sort of generic zombification of you know, companies which should have disappeared, uh, have, have been allowed to survive, and that this will have actually a ne negative impact on, on growth potential uh, in the years ahead? What, what do you make of that? Well, you're, 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 you're looking for reasons to be less optimistic. Let me, let me mention one which is implicit in what I said before turning to the, uh, the zombification of companies, um, which is that there are going to be, uh, most probably, quite a lot of uh, redundancies in some sectors. I mean, the, when, I, when I say there is efficiency, there are efficiency gains, there is uh, productivity. Uh, think of the, the retail sector. Um, you know, all the, the people, the cashiers, um, that's going to, the substitution of automatic uh, um, cashiers to, to, um, uh, to personnel is going inevitably to accelerate. So they're going to be um, redundancies, uh, people sent to unemployment, problems of reallocating uh, labor, away from certain tasks and away from certain sectors. Uh, and that's not going to be an easy problem to, to deal with, especially in, in uh, countries where, you know, frictions in the labor market are more pronounced, it's more difficult. Um, so there will be a need to, to help retrain people, to help them find new jobs. Uh, also, because the the transition to a low-carbon economy is also going to imply redundancies and, uh, and relocation of labor. So, so we're not going to see something very easy to, to, to live with. Now, turning to your, your point about the zombies, um, the, the paradox of this situation is that uh, bankruptcies are at extremely low level. In all countries, we're seeing the same, uh, that... Uh, Essentially, uh, the, the credit instruments that were uh, put in place and the subsidy instruments that uh, were also put in place and actually, you know, 
beefed up uh, as the time went by um, to, to support companies, have preserved companies from, from bankruptcies. Uh, and so the question is what happens when these support instruments are being lifted and they need to be, to be lifted? I mean, they, they need to, to return to something more normal. Um, I think it was right to uh, avoid uh, the bankruptcies in this type of situation because what's important is that uh, you sort out, I mean, the, the mechanisms in place, sort out uh, viable companies from unviable companies. And traditionally, in a normal situation, a good indicator of the viability of a company is its level of debt, its, its solvency. An insolvent company has, you know, most of the cases, an insolvent company is not a viable company. But now you had this, this huge shock, meaning for some companies that were perfectly good and perfectly profitable, that suddenly they lost their market. Um, and their market maybe is going to recover, uh, to return to normal. It, probably in most cases. In some cases, not, because, you know, if you're specialized in business travel, you're most likely going to face a, a slump, a lasting slump. So what needs to be done is to really to do this triage, to use a sort of wartime <laughs> expression, um, and to, uh, to, to help companies that are over-indebted but viable to survive and to, you know, to, to expand and uh, to close down uh, the companies that are not viable. And that's a, that's a hard task. And that's a hard task for the state because of the sheer number of companies. Uh, you know, we were speaking of many small companies, things, for example, of, of restaurants, um, and uh, at the same time, and, and we're speaking of something the state is not used to do. Uh, so the, the, the whole question is how to, to find um, appropriate ways to doing it. And uh, I tend to think that, you know, banks are better placed in some cases. So uh, governments would probably need to rely on a combination of, uh, of what they do and what banks do, perhaps by uh, telling the banks, if you accept to restructure the debt of companies uh, that you consider viable, the state is also going to restructure the, the claims it holds on, on, on these companies, uh, claims resulting from the, uh, you know, the support uh, liquidity scheme that were given to companies or for um, uh, tax uh, deferrals, uh, so that uh, this triage is being, is being done in an effective way. I think, you know, that um, uh, it's, it's really important for the future of, uh, of the economy, for the future of productivity, but to refuse to recognize that uh, you know uh, some uh, of these companies are un unviable, or uh, to to refuse to recognize that some of those companies are viable but uh, over indebted would would precisely create zombies. So so it needs to be done in order to avoid the zombification of uh, certain sectors. Thank you. Um, well, I could ask you dozens of questions, Jean, uh, but you know, uh, we are getting to the, the end of our allocated time, and I want to, to thank you for for sharing your, your insight and, and you know, for sounding actually cheerful. I think, as I said, we, we need that in our current uh, predicament. Um, before I let you go, uh, I would like to ask you for one last contribution um, for our listeners who would like to continue the, the conversation on their own more precisely to continue to document themselves. Um, is there a book, a uh, documentary, uh, an article, someone to follow on Twitter uh, you would recommend in our, in our situation? Who, who do you look for, uh, for, for answers yourself in, this, in the current environment? Hmm. Uh, let, me, let me tell you what I'm currently reading. I'm reading a, a book, but it exists also, in, it's in French, but it exists as a working paper in English by uh, Amory Guettin, Clara Martinez Solidano, and Thomas Piketty on political cleavages and, uh, and social inequality. And it's a fascinating uh, study based on, on the study of 50 democracies over 70 years, I mean, developing as well as, as developed. 
uh, to uh, understand what are the reasons for, for political cleavages, um, what are the factors uh, that determine political choices. And obviously, it's of major importance as we are seeing, you know, new elections coming up in Europe and also to understand what went, uh, uh, what, what happened in the U.S. and what may happen in the future in the U.S., uh, as well as, the, you know, the rise of populism, etc., in many countries. Um, and, and, and the big uh, lesson uh, is that uh, we've seen, but uh, across the board in a very significant way, we've seen the uh, traditional income cleavages Uh, the class cleavages, if you wish, being replaced by educational cleavages. And we knew that, but what is absolutely fascinating is that it's absolutely general in advanced economies. It's not the case in emerging economies, by the way, uh, which are in, where, where the traditional cleavages still apply, but, but it's, it's uh, absolutely overwhelming in advanced economies. And so this is having, I think, uh, deep consequences for the way our politics is structured, um, and therefore for the type of economic policies that are going to be followed. Thank you, Jean. Um, I will actually uh, recommend uh, a piece which, to some extent, is connected to uh, the point uh, Piketty and his co-authors are, are making, which is uh, The Price of Nostalgia, uh, which was published by Adam Posen in, uh, in Foreign Affairs. Uh, subtitle is America's Self-Defeating Economic Retreat. It's a very intriguing piece in which um, Posen explains that um, you know, the sort of U.S. absolute obsession for protecting manufacturing jobs uh, is, is, is to some extent you know, misguided, uh, both in terms of general uh, economic efficiency and also in terms of social fairness, because you know, manufacturing, manufacturing jobs in the U.S., just like you know, in most other developed economies, are mostly the preserve of, of, of white males. Uh, but that's part of you know, the political equation of, of Biden at, at the moment. Uh, it's quite a forceful piece, uh, maybe a few quibbles on, on the stats, but you know, very, very interesting uh, reading. It's a very forceful piece, and um, I would connect it uh, absolutely to the, what I was saying about uh, Piketty's uh, book. Uh, it's the same discussion. It's the, it, it the political determinants of the economic strategy and really the, uh, the, the need for the Democrat to recapture the working class vote uh, drives them into a type of trade policy and perhaps more generally, economic strategy that's uh, closer to the Trump uh, strategy than they would wish, probably, and that uh, many of us uh, had expected. Thank you very much again, John. Uh, it's time to get back to uh, the hustle and bustle of everyday economic life. Uh, we'll be back in, in a month's time uh, for a new macrocast. I, I hope that you know, the listeners uh, enjoyed uh, this, this, new, this new version. And you know, thank you again, John. In the meantime, take care. And goodbye. Thank you, Jude.